Father God, as we have um, prayed earlier on, may it please you to speak to us. May those life-giving words of Jesus come alive in our hearts today as we reflect on this passage. Lord, may it please you to clear any hindrances in me or in my hearers today so that, Lord, your word flows unhindered among us. Come and help us. May your Holy Spirit open our hearts and our minds so that, Lord, we can understand and we can see Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. For the sake of our visitors, my name is Harrison Mungai. I am one of the elders serving alongside Pastor Fidel and Elder John, who is on duty today, Peter Kamau, and also Patrick. Um, today we are coming to the end of our sermon series through the book of Judges. And in a short while, we are going to um, get into that. But before I begin the sermon, and I will ask that the visitors um, would bear with me, because I need to make a statement to all of us who come here to worship every Sunday morning, or even those who are following us online, either for this service or for the previous Swahili service. I'll just take a few minutes to make this statement, and then I'll get back to judges. I'd like to call upon you all, God's people that gather here every Sunday morning, and even all of you who somehow associate yourselves with this church to repentance. By this, I'm specifically talking to members, those who have covenanted to be part of this church family, and even those among you who are in regular attendance, or even those who are exploring membership here at Grace Point Church. I understand we have been going through a hard time since the onset of COVID-19 last year. Churches, including ours, have found it particularly uh, hard to be a tough season, season due to the restrictions that have been imposed on gatherings. And this has obviously meant less contact with other believers. We have lacked fellowship with some people, and yet Christian fellowship is a means of grace that the Lord has given for our discipleship and service. Many of us may also have been affected by loss of income, or even some are going by or getting by on very little. Perhaps also the amount of time that we are having to spend on electronic devices has also increased, meaning that we have perhaps lessened our affection for other people. And maybe we have also been opening up to all sorts of ideas and even teachings. Some of us might also have suffered from COVID itself, but in the Lord's goodness, they have recovered. We praise the Lord who has continued to sustain us in every way. As a church family, we have continued to hear the gospel proclaimed to us every Sunday morning. And even in the middle of the week, through the mid uh, midweek service, we continue to hear the word of God being taught to us. More recently, we have begun doing a daily podcast to encourage ongoing growth in the Lord. And we also praise God that in many other areas of our lives, we have been thriving, be it work or even in family. Indeed, very many families have been birthed among us and even many children born, including those that we shall be receiving into the church family coming Sunday. Some of you have found new jobs or businesses, and indeed there is every reason for us to praise the Lord. But as we are gathered here today, I am concerned, as the lead pastor, that the love of some of us might have grown cold. This is those who are here today, and those who might be following this sermon online, or even those who will get it later on. I observe that some of us have actually withdrawn from attendance or even involvement in the church family altogether. As our duty in shepherding, we the elders have actually reached out to them, but with little fruit. I'd love to address you wherever you are, brothers and sisters who have abandoned fellowship and yet continue to remain on membership, to remind you that Christianity is never lived out as an individual. The gospel is almost always expressed in the form of a community, and it is called the local church, 
the one for which the Lord Jesus Christ died. We are not just called to follow Jesus, we are also called to be a community. We are one body, and when one part is missing, the whole body suffers. But can I also remind you, wherever you are, those of you who have a burdened fellowship, that you are on a dangerous path, and it is not good for your soul. It is like in the cycle of apostasy that we have seen in the book of Judges this far. Please do not say you are not warned to Mekukanya. I also observe that some of us have lost their zeal for the Lord and for his service. They are sitting back and waiting to be served. And that has been alluded to both in the prayer. We had not talked about this, but both in the prayer that was led for us, a congregation of prayer, but also in the announcements that Elder John actually made. There are many among us who are just sitting back and waiting to be served. They are not in any particular ministry. They are, so to speak, consumers. They are merely looking on as others struggle with the work without helping. What happened to every member ministry that the Lord has called us to? We have been told time and again, we are not to be spectators, brethren. We're all to be active players in the work, whether that is in music, in media, in Sunday school ministry, in hospitality, in ushering, wherever it is, None of us is to sit back and wait to be served by others. Very sadly, some only show up when they are serving. Unaona mtu amejipea shughuli sana ile siku ako kwa rota. Ile siku ambayo anafanya kazi dio tunamuona lakini hizi siku zingine hayupo. Ataonekana tena wakati nafasi yake katika rota itafika tena. That is not how to go to grow in godliness, God people. You need to be there whether you are serving or not, so that you can also receive service and ministry from other people. And yet also be ready and available if you are called upon either by your leader or deacon on a short notice in case someone is not there. But none of us are to be on the sacred service. None of us are to be intermittent only showing up when I'm preaching, but not sitting down and being fed from the ministry of others. I observe some of us are not regular. They haven't abandoned the ministry. They haven't abandoned the church or the fellowship. They are still somehow affiliated and they still show up from time to time, but they are not regular. You can't count on them. Oftentimes they are late. You can't see them in prayer meetings or even whenever we have a prayer and fasting gathering, they don't show up for that or for evangelism Saturdays. They are also inactive in their growth groups. Their giving is ungenerous and often irregular. They are sloppy in their singing or even in our congregational uh, times of prayer, very sloppy. These are people who are unavailable to serve. They are those who, when they are asked, would you read the prayers on a Sunday morning? Really, the staff have really to chase them before they can actually confirm. This kind of a Christian is essentially lukewarm. This kind of irregularity that you cannot be counted upon doesn't show any godliness. You are actually essentially doing church at your own terms. You're just showing up just when you need to or when it's okay and convenient. You're not paying any cost whatsoever for the furtherance of the gospel and for the proclamation of it in the local church that the Lord has called us to be part of. Brothers and sisters, might we be creeping back into a backbencher culture where people just like to look at things from afar? Such a culture is toxic. The only thing such a culture can be good at is in complaining and murmuring, which was alluded to in the prayer session. Criticism often thrives in such a context because such a people can never be contented. They don't like the way things are done. And they are not even willing or ready or available.
to help. Are we ourselves and brothers and sisters hearing the cycle of apostasy in Judges? Or might we be assuming that it was for those people then and not for us now? Nimekukanya. But in case you are wondering whether you are the person I'm talking about, here are five ways in which you can tell. One, are you growing in Christ-likeness? Do you find that you are feeding from the gospel and then f- and growing in Christ? Is this becoming evident in your speech and in your conduct? Is the word of God shaping you to express true humility and godliness? How is your devotional life? How committed to the Lord are you? But secondly, who can give an account about your faith or your service? Are you accountable to anyone? Are your leaders, be they elders, growth group leaders, deacons, or ministry leaders, are they at ease with your commitment? Can they count on you? Can you be depended upon that you'll show up? Does anyone expect anything of you? Or you're just floating along? How are you, thirdly, obeying the call to tell others about Jesus? Is there anyone you are reading the Bible one-to-one with? Are you discipling anyone? Is there anyone you see from time to time and are praying for in a committed way that they may come to know the Lord? Or are you in a comfort zone somehow? Are you just happy because we know we get together with like-minded people on a Sunday morning, we sing good hymns, we dance, and we sometimes rejoice, and then we go home? Is that you who is perhaps settled in a happy place? Fourthly, how is your generosity for the Lord's work, primarily here in your local church? And I'm not coming at you because of a financial reason. Please don't get it wrong. But are you sacrificially giving? Or perhaps might you have just given up and maybe you're just doing token kind of giving, just show up on the queue, but not really giving with an intention that the gospel may be fathered and that indeed God's kingdom might grow. Does anyone know about your giving? Is there anyone who you are accountable to? Many of us have been paired with someone. Be it the men uh, were paired sometime last year. And the women also have a pair, like a buddy with whom you walk or with whom you share. Do they know about your own generosity? Or the fact that the giving here at Grace Point is anonymous perhaps gives you a ticket not to give at all? Might you have abdicated your responsibility as a follower of Jesus? And finally, how well are you doing in one anothering? The New Testament calls believers to a lot of one anothering. That's the whole point of being a community. We're to be there for one another. We're to love one another. We're to encourage one another. We're to honor one another. We're to admonish and rebuke one another. We are to serve one another. We are to bear with one another. We are to confess our sins to one another. And the list goes on. And many other things we are called to as a community because we've been called to one another and we've been called to Christ. How well are you doing in that? Could your heart be callous so that even when you hear that your brother or sister is in pain, it's just like water off a duck's back. It doesn't get you. But when you hear that someone is bereaved, you're not concerned. But when you know that someone in our church family is out of work, it has nothing to do with you. But when you see your brother is backsliding, you don't give them a call. But when you can't see so-and-so on a, church, on a Sunday morning continuously for a while, you never reach out to them in love. Or when the list of names of those on our watch list is given, it doesn't bother you. Could your heart have become hard? 
the beginning of this year in the Swahili service, we had a sermon series taken from the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. This is the message to the seven churches. But one striking message that I'll close with was the one that was sent to the church in Laodicea, where the Lord Jesus said that to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth, says the Lord. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, says the Lord, I rebuke and discipline. So be honest and repent. Here I am, says Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Please take a minute and pray. Lord, have mercy on us, we pray. Help us to repent, not just in words and emotions, but indeed in our minds, by resolve and by actions, followed by words and followed by deeds that indeed display true repentance. Have mercy on us. You know the hearts of men. Every single thing not announced, not seen in public, you know it. And I pray that, Lord, you will have mercy upon us as a community that seeks to exhibit the gospel, as a people that are committed to gospel centrality, to faithful proclamation, and to a mission or living. Grant that, Lord, we would indeed exhibit those very things so that your gospel is not maligned, your name is not maligned, and is held out for the watching world here in Kikuyu Township and in the regions beyond. And we pray these things in the name of the merciful Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's the story. There's a PowerPoint if media team is so happy to queue up that. We will get to grips with the story and then we will soon be out of here. It was a cold day in July when Omolo came back from school with a heavy heart. He had spent much of his day in the library since he did not want to go into the field. The reason for that was because some mean boys had made some remarks about his legs and he had been hurt and he said he's going to leave the football club and join journalism. And so on this day, he was perusing through the daily papers and reading articles online in the school computers. He always enjoyed books he always loved the reading stories of different people, like the Safari Rally champions who drove really fast, or even the Kenyan marathon champions who win great races all over the world. However, on this day, page after page in the newspaper, he read very disturbing news, such as, armed robbers raid a home and murder the husband in Kisumu, or students burnt alive in a dormitory fire in Kwale, or, police arrest two men in Muranga for forcing two women into female genital mutilation. Or, a man is jailed for raping and impregnating his two daughters in Tarakanithi. And so on this day, Molo could not wait to get home to tell his father all about it. He had always wanted to have a bright future one where he could be certain that his own hard work in school or at work would be rewarded. A future where leaders are accountable, even where the vulnerable, like the sick, 
the elderly and the minority, are protected. What a place where people can live with each other in peace, love, and unity. But this did not seem to be the case for his own country, Kenya. And so, even before dropping his school bag, he launched into questioning his father. Why is there so much? Why is there so much pain in the world? Why is there so much injustice? He railed at his father. Taking a deep breath, his father turned to him. A little bit uncertain if Omolo is now of age to engage these kind of questions. But since he had asked, it was probably time to have the conversation. Do you remember the stories we've been reading in the Bible, Omolo? Asked his father. Yes, I do, he said quickly. Now let me remind you one of those. A long time ago, in the days after Joshua had died, the people of Israel abandoned Yahweh, the Lord, their God, who, if you remember, had rescued them from slavery in Egypt and settled them in the land of Canaan. Yet the people began worshipping idols. Every time they sinned against the Lord, he punished them through a foreign king who would dominate and harass them. But if they cried to the Lord, he would send to them a rescuer to deliver them from their oppressor. This went on for a long time. The striking thing is, they had no king. They had not submitted themselves fully to the Lord God, who was their king. And also, they did not have a human king to rule over them. Those days, everyone did as they saw fit. Hmm, asked tomorrow. How was life like in those days? He interjected. It must have been very scary to live in a country without a government and even without the worship of a true God. It was very bad, really bad, his father continued. The writer of the story gives us a glimpse of it in the concluding chapters of the book of Judges. In 17 and 18th chapter, he shows us the religious decay where idolatry, the worship of idols, is practiced openly even by a Levite, a man who was supposed to be a priest to God. And in chapters 19 to the end of the book, he shows us the moral decay of what was happening nationally through the story of one man. What was really going on? Tell me more, insisted Omoro to his dad. Well, Omoro's father straightened his face, trying to gain composure. It was very dark. The writer tells us of yet another Revite who married a, a woman, another woman actually, a concubine, which is actually a big word, which means an unofficial wife. And the story goes that this concubine leaves him and goes back home to her father's house. The Levite then decides to go to her, and her father receives him. That is the Revite very well. He stays a few days on his father-in-law's encouragement. But on the fifth day, he finally leaves, even though it was late in the day. And then he comes to a town to find somewhere he could stay for the night. And he settles for a place called Gibe, which is one of the territories that belonged to the Israelite people of Benjamin. There, an old man offers him a place to stay for the night. But as they enjoyed the evening, some men from the area surrounded the house, demanding for the doors to be opened so that they may have sex with the Levite. But this old man, his host, pleaded with them, saying, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. But what he says to his friends and neighbors is even more outrageous. He says, Behold, here are my two daughters and even his concubine. Let me bring them out to you. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But again, as this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the man would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they violated her and abused her all night until the morning. 
And as the day was beginning to, to break, they let her go. This woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where his master was. What? asked Tomorrow, utterly shocked at the story. That sounds like what happened in Genesis 19 in the days of Lot. Yes, it does, said Tomorrow's father. It was, in fact, Sodom all over again. But I tell you what, Tomorrow actually gets worse. After a night of sexual violation, which is rape by a gang of men, this woman, his concubine, is left for dead. And you know what, tomorrow? The most horrifying thing is that this Levite takes this body of the dead woman, cuts it up into 12 pieces, and sends a piece to each of the tribes of Israel. Surely. How could this happen, asks Samoro. Were there no police or laws to protect the people? Actually, there were laws. There was a law to protect the weak, the poor, and the foreigner, Samoro. But remember what the writer told us at the beginning of chapter 19? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what they wanted. So what happened next, asks Saniga Omoro. Why well, everybody gets very angry with this tribe of Benjamin because of what happened in Gibe. Or even perhaps they were made angry more because they received a piece of human flesh mailed to them. And so they gang up and fight against that tribe, almost completely finishing it. Here were God's people fighting against themselves. However, there were a few survivors about 600 of them. And in order to give them wives, the writer tells us that the rest of the Israelite people raided yet another tribe of Israel in order to try and get wives for these 600 men who had survived. It says in Judges 21.10, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword. Also the women and the little ones. This is what you shall do. Every male and every woman who has lain with a male, you shall devote to destruction. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not slept with a man. And they brought them up to the camp at Shiloh to be the wives for the Benjaminites. Things were getting really dark and horrifying. And yet, they weren't even enough. Only 400 young virgins, young girls. And there were 600 men. So they devised yet another plan to snatch wives from people as they went to worship the Lord at Shiloh. Go and lie in Abush in the vineyards and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyards and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go back to the land of Benjamin. Such was the life in the days of Judges. This must have been a very difficult time for everybody, said Amoro. Can you imagine Benjaminite children who had nothing to do with the men who had sinned in Gibe in a lot of pain, all of them, together with their mothers, killed by their own countrymen. It must be horrific for these women and children. Yes, it was. Those really were dark days, says Amoros' father. In fact, the writer closes his book with those very sad words, that in those days there was no king. Everybody did as I saw fit. And Amoros, what do you think are some of the lessons that we can learn from that story. Moro thought he could find only about three lessons. One of them was that when God's people abandoned Yahweh and worshipped idols, he judged them very severely. 
He had abandoned them to their own devices. They were left to do whatever they saw was fit. Second lesson was that when the true king is not on the throne, then people are very broken and mean to one another. In fact, there are no morals to live by, and it can be a very dangerous society to live in. Such was the nature of this chapter we have read. The true king is not on the throne. People are morally corrupt. Everyone is doing what they think is right. Men are having sex with men, homosexuality. Women are being abused and children are being murdered. Those who have strength or might are automatically right. And so because you can snatch girls as they go to a dance or as they go to church, those were the days no one seemed to have any protection. The true king was not on the throne. But surprisingly, I also notice, says Amoro, that Yahweh is never too far from his people. It is very interesting that even in those very dark days, people could still inquire of the Lord, and he would still somehow answer them. Indeed, those are very accurate lessons, Amoro, says his father. And they are also good lessons for us today. And if we abandon the Lord as our king, society breaks down. Families fall apart. Corruption thrives. Rape, theft, murder, and injustice become common. Yet the good news is that the Lord is never too far from his people. For if we return to him in repentance and trust, he hears our prayers. But you know what, tomorrow? There is even more. When it is very dark, the stars shine the brightest. Because of all the darkness there was, there is such a longing for a king, a good king who would rule over them with justice and righteousness. And I can imagine then the question in every child's heart and mind who was living in those days must have been, will such a king ever arise in Israel? Will there be a true godly king who will rule with justice, who will protect our nation? I think we will see that at the beginning, or at least the beginning of it, in the very next book of Ruth. But before you go, we can rejoice and give thanks because of government. In fact, the Bible teaches us in Romans 13 that government is appointed by God to exercise authority on his behalf. He appoints it to restrain evil and to reward good. It doesn't always work perfectly or moral, since we are still in a broken world. But thank God that there is a government. And yet, that's not all. There will yet be another king, the ultimate king, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom Israel really longed for, who will one day return to establish his kingdom. This kingdom will be full and perfect here on earth. And in the meantime, we are to worship him alone, as the true God, to live rightly in accordance with his commands and tell others about him. What a glorious day it will be, Omolo. Well, what a glorious day it will be, wondered Omolo. The end. Father God, we thank you for the many things that we have learned through this book. We are those who backslide. We are those sinful rebels who walk away. And yet you are the gracious Father who gives a king. Please help us to embrace the king that you have anointed. That you have anointed. Please help us to run to him and to obey him. Help us to trust in him alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Thank you.